I'm uh, Dr. Anastasia Wiley, and I'm here tonight to talk about, um, to give a talk, and it's called Viewing Cultural Landscape Through Tlingit Place Names. And we're going to use uh, the Chilkoot Village site as an example. And I have as my guest, Sally, and I can't roll the R in your last name, Buratin. 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 Sally Buratin is, is um, uh, well, uh, you can introduce yourself in terms of your background, Sally, please. I uh, um, come from Tuklon. I'm a uh, cat. Uh, also, I'm a city. Um, Shah. Um, uh, historian. Um, I guess you might call me an a encyclopedia, <laughs> whereas, whereas in the old times, uh, encyclopedias were chosen people, and they studied under, their, under the tutelage of, of, the, um, of other encyclopedias. So you learned history from the age of two years until you were already a grown woman. And uh, that's the history of who I am, what I am. This, um, this uh, program, in terms of uh, studying these place names, was part of a native archaeological training program that uh, I run uh, each summer here in Haines. And this year it was at Chilkoot, and Sally came out and talked to us because when she was a young girl, it was her job to take care of eight elder women out there at Chilkoot. So she knew quite a bit about the background of, of uh, the area and especially some of the stories. And that's why I invited her to come tonight. I do have some written down, but it's so much nicer if you can hear them from the actual person. Okay, uh, shall we start? Can you all see the screen? I guess so. <laughs> so I okay. can see it okay. Okay, great. I'm ready. Um, okay, here we go. Viewing cultural landscape through Tlingit place names. Um, <clears throat> now, it has my name and uh, my corporation, SRS, on it. I also, however, uh, have credits for other people who helped with this project. Christopher Hodge from Klukwan is the GIS GPS uh, coordinator for um, Chilkoot Indian Village. And I have his Tlingit name, Gunaid. Um, he uh, located all of the place names on maps. So when you see these maps, they're done by Christopher. Then the site locations and the photographs, both Christopher and Stanley Hotch helped me uh, with those. And then the PowerPoint was um, compiled by my assistant, Resine, and she's from uh, South Africa. Um, that is her, Tigrinya is her tribal group, and Eritia is her, uh, is the country she's from. Okay, um, now this is the first map, the overall map that uh, Christopher established. And what I'd like to point out here, this has all of the place names that we were able to find. Now let me see if I can do this with their, okay, right in the center here, you see that there's a big cross-hatched area. That area is what the State Historic uh, Preservation Office here in Alaska has recorded as Chilkootquan. And they made it that whole curve on the river right there. However, if you look at all the place names and you see how far they extend to the bottom and how far they extend to the south, that is more realistic uh, res representation of Chilkootquan. So this is the reason why I uh, started doing this, because um, Parks and Rec Recreation want to do some planning on different parks in that area. And also, um, there's other uh, development projects that are planned. And so you need to have the full 
uh, scope of the site. Otherwise, um, the developers won't know that they're about to impact some site that's important. Place names are extremely important because they tell the social history of the people. Now, here's a list of all of the place names that we made. Um, you're not going to, we're not going to be reading the whole list, but you see if you look on the side, they're color coded and number one, two, and three are all um, gray because they are associated with rocks. For instance, soft white rocks, igneous rocks, or dark rocks, um, and areas below the mountain and so forth with rocks. Um, this chart, in order to put together this whole place name list of 50 place names, we used several different sources. Um, we used, as, and they're listed across the top. Uh, three of them are by um, Thomas Thorpe. He is the place name king. He's the person who first started working with place names for his dissertation back in 1977. I brought several of these books with me, but the most significant for those of you who aren't here and you're in different cities, uh, one of the most important is from the Klondike Gold Rush National Park because it's free. And I think any one of you can get this uh, at any time. And what you do, it's their ethnographic overview, and it's for the Con Klondike, the Gold Rush National Historic Park, and just write to them. Um, the man in charge is Carl Gerke, K-A-R-L-G-U-E-R-K-E. -E. Yes, and there's some locally in the museum and in the library. Um, but you can also get your own copy free. No, no, they have got a box of these and a box of these and that. Oh, there are. Oh, okay, great. I saw a bunch of them left. So. Oh, okay, good. So I'll pass this around so people can see it. Each one of these books that are put out, um, the two up at the top you see that say Thornton on the left, and then Ha'ani, which also has is Goldschmidt and Haas on the, on the right-hand side, they all list different place names, but none of them have all of the place names. So that's part of the project, is to put them together. And you can see by comparing the two columns that the ones on the, some are on the left uh, don't show up on the right, and some on the right don't show up on the left. Well, now we have a complete list of everything that's known uh, today. We took the 50 place names, and down at the bottom here, you can see the um, tabulation of the 50 total place names. There's 14 that are associated with rocks, five with uh, different water sources, uh, another five that are salmon or fish of one kind or another, mostly salmon, killer whale, there's three of those, and there's seven that are land names. For instance, if you look at the top of this page at 29 there, that's a mountain goat trail. So that's one of the land-oriented ones. And then finally, there's 16 that are houses or villages or cemeteries, that kind of thing. So roughly a, a third were rocks, a third had to do with water and water animals, and then a little more than a third the land. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do is start looking at them by different types. So we'll start with special rocks in the landscape, toolstone and uh, commemorative rocks. Toolstone means um, stone outcrops that the native people went to to gather materials to make tools. And so anthropologists call it toolstone. So we have a couple of those that we will be looking at. Um, we'll start, it happens that the way this um, falls just by talking about these. Geographically, I can follow the whole um, start at the bottom where you see uh, Le Coup Tac at the very bottom right hand corner and we'll go all the way up the river into Chilkoot Lake and then all the way back down the other side of Lutep. This slide is, shows the backside of Lutep Inlet and you can see that there's successive landforms um, out there, let me see if I can point to them here. Here's one of the landforms and the second landform. You have these juts coming out, and what these are are rock outcrops that are coming out into, into the ocean irregularly. And these are important because they have materials that were important to the native people. And of course, in the rock cuts, 
you can see them most clearly. So how do you pronounce that? Takil? Takil. And it means, I guess, soft white rocks. Um, and you can see the, the uh, rocks are white. Um, they're sedimentary rocks, mudstones or limestones, and they're made of weathered or eroded fossils. Um, and it's the softest type of rock there is. And the native people recognized it. They saw it without the road cutting through it. <laughs> they saw it in the natural rock outcrop and had a place name for it. And these place names not only identify something on the landscape, but also were uh, mnemonic devices to, uh, so you could talk to someone and say, well, go over near Takil, go over there. We just saw a goat over there or whatever. So they, they were uh, signposts, so to speak. Um, road signs for, for the people. Here's a close-up of the white, soft white rocks. Now the next one is very interesting. This is a drainage going uh, right along the road there at Lutec. And the place name here means black rocks hard enough for heating for cooking. And this is really important because the way that they heated up their food was to heat rocks and put rocks like in the water um, to heat up the water and then and then boil the, the food in and, and so forth. And most of the rocks around here are softer rocks, so it had to be, it's, it's such an ingenious way of saying it, black rocks hard enough for heating for cooking. And I brought one of these here. Um, people in the other place are not gonna, uh, places are not gonna be able to uh, see it, but I'll pass it around. Um, can you see this that I'm holding? Y yes. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I'll pass it around. I'll start with Sally and then I'll pass it. Feel what's significant about this rock. It's extremely hard and extremely heavy. It's very, very heavy for its size. And I think that everyone will notice that when they're holding it. Um, it's a granite rock that has crystals that interlock of all different kinds, but there's a lot of iron in it, which is one thing that makes it so heavy. And um, that's a very significant place name because, uh, like I say, you can't find these granite rocks just everywhere. Most of the um, outcrops in the Haines area are shales and softer rocks. The granites are out by the Chilkoot area and to have this is a drainage, so actually to have drainages where you can just go down and collect them. There's a close-up here on this one. You can see in the center sort of a, a gray, dark rock. There's blacker ones to the left. If they get wet, they turn black. Okay, the next rock type is commemorative rocks. And I'll, uh, you can read along while I read this to you. This is deer rock, which is going up Lutec. Um, getting into the Chilkoot River. And it says, over the years, the deer has been known to the eagle and raven clans as the most peaceful uh, animal in the forest. Because of this, during the ceremonies at the conclusion of a war, a member of opposing warring clan was chosen to negotiate the settlement of peace between the warring groups. And he was known as the deer. He would go to a certain rock where he could think deeply and carefully meditate about peace so that the best terms would result. Here at the rock, he would be offered the initial peace overtures. The negotiations which followed would then uh, call the highest level of diplomatic skills. After many days, a peaceful settlement would finally be agreed upon. Thus, the rock where the peace negotiations occurred was designated by the Khadi if I'm saying that correctly, yeah. clan, as the deer or peace rock and stood for peace now and forever. The deer rock thus saved the lives of countless members of the eagle and raven clans that might otherwise have been lost in needless wars. For that reason, it, consisted, it was considered a very important part of the heritage of the native people. And I think that most groups had a deer rock. Yes. An area where, where negotiations could occur and people could stop and, that is, and talk. That is called Oakan Oh, okay, great. Uh -huh. 
and here's here's a picture of it now when um department of transportation put in the highway out there they bulldozed it they broke it up and so there was such an uproar from the people because this was an extremely important place name um and um spot for them that they sort of cobbled it back together but you can see from these two pictures that it, it was a fairly large rock and a big flat rock where people could sit and talk that's that's what they did to cut one on on top of cut one hill mm -hmm. they blew that that thing because that's where they have the peace rock up there oh yeah oh my goodness yeah that was destroyed now here's one for you sally uh if you can see it this is it, in the place name books they call it owl cliff but that's yeah. the i for those of you looking from the other other place as well there's an i right in the uh in the middle here if you could see that built right in the rocks now this is an obvious um visual landmark that again can be used to state where you are but it has other meanings um do you what would you like uh, to tell us about this rock um i don't know how to pronounce that owl gg oh that's cliff um how do you pronounce owl carol seek su no uh that's out oh. uh huh uh, and what did the people think when they looked up and saw that? Because that's really right over the main village site. Yes, that that gave you uh, a sense of this is home. Mm. This is this belongs to Shukah at the Ani Awaha. Mm -hmm. the, this this tells you that this is your home mm -hmm. that when you look up on that and from going on the other side is where they have the uh where they put the uh the small box oh yes mm -hmm. yeah yes and we, i'll show that place yeah, as that's... we go along um, so this was an identifier for the actual Chilkoot village yeah. site itself. Now, um, this is a picture. Now we've reached the lake up there, and you can see it's surrounded by mountains. And um, this is a specific um, place name and site that's very, very important. Um, this was, it's translated as Little Red Snapper or the knob where the mountain broke off. Yes. That knob there used to be on top. You don't have one closer over on this side here? Uh, no, although we'll see one later where you can see it further back, yeah. But this, this knob is what she's talking about, and you can see the red right here. This area is red, and it really stands out when you're, when you're standing, you know, looking at the lake as something different. That's why it's called Little Red Snapper. Right. Um, when that broke off and the rest of the, the mountain hit the water, it broke the land bridge that was there. Uh, they used to have a, a land bridge there, and they called it Kastiaquan. Uh, they used to have the waterfall there, and mm -hmm. it would rush so, so, uh, so loudly that people yelled at each other. Their their voices were really uh, powerful to to holler over the the waterfall. Mm -hmm. So they called it Kastiaquan. Oh, very neat. The people that lived under the waterfall. Mm -hmm. And when that uh, mountain fell, it washed away all the people that were... In that area. Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the stories I brought was Maria Ackerman wrote about this. She wrote it down. 
And I'll read just a little bit, but when, when you were telling us this, st this summer, it was very um, vivid, the way you were talking about how it fell down and rushed, the water rushed, and you'll hear that in this story. She says, what follows is the story of one man who was hunting alone one day high up on the mountain on the west side. He was over on the other side of the lake that we saw to begin with. He paused to rest and in doing so looked back to see the village by the lake. It was his home. As he was watching, a huge portion of one of the mountains on the east side slid into the lake. The slide caused the lake to rise to a tremendous height and the water raced to the river to seek its own level. In doing so, it took everything in its path, leaving nothing standing or living. The hunter hurried to what was once his home. Nothing remained. Dead people were along the beach, which yeah. is exactly what you were saying. He was so depressed at what he saw that he tried to kill himself. All his people were killed, his family and his friends. He decided he would join them in death. He started to chop down a tree. When the tree started to fall, he tried to lie down where it was falling, but the tree missed him. Next, he decided to hang himself, and when he had made preparations, the rope broke. He then decided that he was meant to live. He went to one of the nearby villages for help. He told them of the terrible tragedy, and they returned with him to the place of disaster and disposed of all the dead according to their custom. Um, and what was very interesting about this was this summer when we were excavating in that region out there, we, uh, we did mostly survey and recordation, but a little bit of excavation. And in, in the excavation holes, what we came up with was um, a sand layer, and then on top of the sand layer was a burn layer. And some of the stories talk about how the, so many people died, they could have buried them all in the ground, so they put them in one of the houses and burnt the house. And um, the sand layer now was also very interesting because um, Steve Langdon from the uh, University of Alaska at Anchorage happened to be down, and he was, he's was he been studying uh, the fish traps, and particularly of this site, which you'll see some of them. And he's looked at many of these house pits and said, you know, ask, what is this sand layer? Well, Austin Hammond has a story that when this occurred, there was sand. There was a beach yeah. all around here. And when this occurred, all the sand went up in, in the tidal wave that occurred, an actual uh, lake tidal wave, and washed down the river. And now the sand is down on the other side of the river. Um, and we did, we did find sand layer with a burnt layer on top, which is very interesting because it went along with these various oral traditions about this place. And it was on... Were these? Pardon? What are the years that this slide happened? Uh, that's a very good question. Probably back, at least back to the 1500s, if not Maybe older. Maybe even older. If not older. Older than that. It yeah. could be older than that. So Chilkoot, I should tell you up front, Chilkoot has several different, uh, next map I'll show you some of the dots, but it has several different villages, so to speak. The village moved several different times. For instance, when this happened, people left. Mm -hmm. And there were um, different kinds of um, disease disasters where, you know, um, smallpox or the flu, uh, some of these would um, just would uh, kill a lot of the people, then they'd leave again and come back. Well, there's a weir down at the mouth that was found um, associated with the site and that has a, one of the pieces of wood was dated, radiocarbon dated. And it was radiocarbon dated to 2,000 years ago. So people have been in the Chilkoot region for uh, two th over 2,000 years. Yeah. I mean, they were there before to make the weir. And then, um, you know, uh, had the weir and lived in one of these village sites. So part of the studies that would be so important out there is, is excavating a little bit on each of the sites to get the sequence and where they were first and why they there moved. Was, there was a story of ancient times where uh, it was told of, of a flood that happened before there was, before mm -hmm. there was a time. The tidal wave. The mm -hmm. tidal wave. But there was a flood there, mm -hmm. and you you find the three three sentinels 
up on the mountains there that uh, just uh, petrified mm -hmm. themselves there mm -hmm. to watch for. I for, don't know if we can see those on this other. Oh, they're up. At, they're in the clouds. They're that was the, the problem with this. Yeah. On the top of the mountain, on the side, what she's talking about, there's three peaks that that stick up, and they call that's translated to the three sentinels or yes. the, the three guards. Yeah. Guardsmen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that's from the time of the flood, that they were there was people there mm -hmm. during that time. Right. So uh, you can figure it out how many thousand years they've been there. That's right. And that's where archaeology comes in. That's where it's important is to try to help on this. I mean, dating that one piece of wood out of the weir, the fishing weir, was extremely significant to come up with a 2,000-year-old date. Okay, now we're back here again. And you see the green patch in the center that I talked about. That's where um, the um, State Historic Preservation Office has that recorded as the village site. Um, the arrow that's leading down to it has all of these place names up in the top, right up in here next to the north arrow. There's at, there were at least um, three major houses, if not four, uh, what's listed on some of the early maps is um, a Lower Down Sun House, the Mountain House, the Otter House. Other people say there was originally an Eagle House there as well. And then there's several smoke houses, one of which is Patty Gonets, Gonets, uh, who was the last person to really live in that area for an extensive period of time. And you can see both above and below that green patch. Um, salmon areas that were associated, but the white ones now are different different village occupations all in and around that area. And the salmon is, of course, why, why they were there. It was one of the life-staining elements, sustaining elements of the area. All the white ones were villages? Uh, just in that region. Oh. Just in that region. There are different settlements. And we'll see some of them in the next pictures here. I have a lot of photographs of the area. Uh, this is another thing that we did as part of our project was to gather all the historic photographs we could from Sheldon Museum, the ones that are online and the different photographic centers and so forth. And there's a series of 10 here we'll be looking at that, that you'll see the development of the, the uh, settlement in this region. And again, related to the salmon specifically. And the 18, this one is 1890 summer camp. It's interesting because it's, it appears to be mostly tents on the side. And here's another one. You're looking at the same area, but you're above looking down on top of it. And there's, it's 1894. There's eight Tlingit housetops in, in the middle there with the Chilkat River um, beyond that and the mountain in the, in the very, um, you know, backyard. What's interesting is to look at all the boards. These are, a lot of these are very old houses because, let me see where my finger is here, okay. Uh, because of the vertical, the way the, the houses were built with the vertical boards. And also, you see how they're piled on top. One thing that most, a lot of people don't know is that what the, thing that people would do is they had uh, summer villages and winter villages mm -hmm. because the resources changed and what they needed changed. And they would leave the frame of the house, but they'd take all the boards with them. So then when they went to the next place, they'd use as many as they needed for that frame and then store the rest right up on top. And the reason that they did this was because they only had some tools. And so to make a board with a stone tool is, is a, a very um, time-consuming proposition. And so they weren't going to just let them stand there and weather while they're gone, so they took them with them, um, which is very interest, a very and, interesting way and a of lot doing it. And a lot of Caucasians thought that the villages were deserted and, and left, you know, mm -hmm. so they'd... Uh, uproot everything. That's right, and and that's something for all of you to keep in mind when you see census, the various census um, that were taken. 
We have a census taker right here in Carroll. And you know very well that um, people are always in their homes, but that doesn't mean they, do, they don't live there. And so the population estimates that we have for different points in time for the Chilkat people, I'm sure are way off because they had to come in the summer. They came on boats, they came in the summer, and then the summer is when there's a lot of different spring, summer, and fall, a lot of different movement, and a lot of different activities occurring. So even these houses, they might not be there if it's hooligan season. Mm -hmm. They'd be down further on the river and so forth. And so frequently they would miss, miss the inhabitants because they'd be off someplace else uh, in the subsistence uh, cycle. This is an interesting picture. It's from 1894. It shows families next to the sum one of the summer houses. Um, notice the calico, calico um, material was very big uh, in the in that time period. Like for instance, right here, this gal with her calico shirt. And here's another one, the little boys, all dressed up in their finery, but you notice they're barefoot. <laughs> And uh, some of the early explorers, now that's a very interesting because they would talk about the Tlingit people being barefoot but not having calluses on their feet. They could walk so well on the rocks or, or the sand or whatever that they didn't get calluses on their feet, which is really fascinating. Some of the descriptions that you get from the early explorers. And that was from Vancouver in uh, back in, uh, in the 1700s, late 1700s, who said that. Here's a nice picture of, of the village. Uh, someone went all the way over on the other side of the river to take this. And you can again see at least eight houses there. But all in front of each one of those houses, if you look, there's a scaffolding with fish drying on it. And if you counted up that fish, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of fish that are drying out there. And one of the questions that, um, for instance, um, they have uh, the people that are studying the fish weirs and so forth, like Steve Langdon was, you know, why did they have so many fish? Well, you have to remember that they traded with the interior as well as storing it for the winter. I mean, the, they had their own needs and, and then they also traded fish. I mean, even to this day, interior native people um, like from Puckshu and Haynes Junction, when they come down, I mean, that's what they want. They want herring eggs, they want hooligan, they want crab, um, because they don't have it up there. And so it, it was, uh, uh, evidently, Chilkoot here was a major fish trading area, it appears, yeah. um, at least back in 1895. Oh, are they there? Yeah, you can, I can see them. Oh, that's right. Let me see if I can use his computer and point, the, I don't know, if, oh yeah, like right in here. That's the shag neck. Yeah, where, where is it? Uh, left. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right here. Yeah, up in that region. No, at the very point. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's hard to move this thing. Oh. <laughs> Wherever it is. There we go, right up in there. Yeah. Very good, thank is you. It, is it just me, Anastasia, or are the trees in some of these photos relatively short? I mean, I feel like when you look at the, the area today, the trees are quite tall. Right, and there's a reason for that, because um, the glaciers, there was um, what they call the Little Ice Age. And that, uh, what happened in this area was that the glaciers built up again, just like they had 10,000 years ago. And um, so, uh, all the trees and things that existed before about 1300 all got mowed down or, or smashed by the glaciers. You can even find wood in, in from that time period. They've dated pieces of wood that were under the glacier. Well, these glaciers didn't melt till like 1770. And when that happened, the, the, um, when the glaciers melted, the, the weight of the glaciers was so great that the land started rising because your glaciers are melting, there's less weight on the land, so the land started rising. And here in the Haynes area, it rises just about the fastest of anywhere in the world. It has a very fast rate of rising. Um, people who are on the, on the rivers or on the ocean are getting more land free every year. It's almost uh, an inch a year, eight-tenths of an inch a year that it rises. So you can see, 
only when it started rising then could it build up build up a vegetation mat and then start having trees so all these trees are from 1770 well we're only 1895 there and so um, it takes, I think, about 200 years to get mature trees, and you haven't had that time yet in these photographs. Very good question. And, those, and those house, and each house would have anywhere from 100 to 150 people That's right. living in each house. Very good. Yeah, very good. So you can see that like, if you have eight or 10 houses there, you could easily have 1,000 people out there. Um, and some of the estimates now, uh, within the last oh, 20 years, I'd say, a lot of Russian documents now, since the Cold War is over, a lot of Russian documents have been made available and are being translated. And one of them claimed that in the Chilkat region, for just going up Chilkat River, for Klukwan and Yundastaki and 19 Mile, there were 5,000 men alone. Well, then that's 10,000 with the women, and then you add what's an average number of children in the Tlingit family. You know, at least four or five or so. 10 to 20. <laughs> there you go. Very yeah. good. Thank you. So, you know, I mean, you're up in the of more than 10,000 people, and that's a real high estimate compared to some of the other senses, but don't forget that these people were coming in the summertime. So this is really interesting, and they, they got that information in the Russian document, it's dated to 1800, and they got the information from local, local um, Tlingit people mm -hmm. who were captured by them and who were telling them about each of the villages and who was in the village and what was the population and so forth. So this shows a very busy time here in this one. Here's a close-up, and um, it's what you can see, uh, the salmon hanging down. And one of the big questions was, what is it? I mean, why does the salmon look like that? Well, they had what they called newspaper salmon. You know about that. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I understand it's where you cut the salmon in half uh, uh, you know, not completely, so that you can hang it, but then each of the halves are then cut in half. Yes. So you've got like four pieces. This here is uh, is the first frying. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're letting the uh, uh, slime dry off first, and then they they go and slice the rest, and they and it all falls out, and then you get the aturashi, and then that's put in another area. And it's lots of fun. Mm -hmm. Lots of fun. Here's another one. Now, the, these hanging racks, though, I wrote in here that it looks like the hides of fur-bearing animals of some sort on these particular um, racks in this close-up. And notice every village has at least one dog in the foreground. No cats. I'm sorry, Carol. <laughs> um, Okay, and here's 1894 again, close-up of a wooden fish trap. These are ingenious, all these different types of traps. I mean, people are still studying them. Like I said, Steve Langdon, just this last summer, was uh, gathering photographs such as these and going to Klukwan to, and, and different people in Haines to interview the native people on how these actually worked. And then these, this picture is really interesting that way. It's 1910. But you can see that not only do you have these, these fishing platforms or weirs, but you actually have um, like a bridge going out to them. You can see a well, whole series can, of bridges there. You can see that land bridge was right, right, right there. Uh, no, this isn't going to work. I'll have to use this one. Um, you can talk. Whoop, whoop. How do I go back here? Hold on. Oops. Okay. Here we right are. Right there. So you're talking about up, the little up, one up, or up, up, this one? Up. This one? The up. big one over here yeah, on the right side. There. The big right one there. on the side up here. There. Yeah. Right there. Mm-hmm. See? Yes. That's, that's the one that broke when it broke down. Oh, I see. So there were land bridges like these yes. at the time when um, when little snapper snapped, as yeah. they call them. 
very interesting. Look how crowded the river is here. And, and, and each family, each house had their own trap. Yes, yes, that's correct. Uh, and now here's another picture, although Marsha Hodge isn't quite sure this is Klepon. I mean, no, uh, that that's, this is Chilkoot. That's, um, um, that's what it says in the museum. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very famous picture that says it's Chilkoot, but... No, that's, uh, over on this side here, that's, uh, Raven House. Hmm. That last house over mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All those others is n are no longer in existence. That that one over there is Raven House, because uh, in the Raven House that that is that's still there. Very interesting. This is one picture that we need to to check out, and yeah. this is part of what we do because some of these things are mislabeled. Mm -hmm. I think Sally's right. I had never noticed that before, but it's, in the, it's after Raven House got moved to town. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Because if you look to the left. That's consistent across the river with the waterfall. Right. Yeah. I mean, she, you know, Marsha Hodge immediately said to me, it's way too open. I mean, what are you thinking? And I said, yeah. wait, it says it. It's that's in the museum. <laughs> the, so, mountain, the, the mountain profile, though, I'm almost certain the profile of the mountain on the upper left there is, is right above Chilkoot. Well, it's, it's, it is awfully open. Uh, but, you know, this is what we did. Now, this is what um, Christopher Hodge and um, Stanley Hodge and I did. We took these photographs out there, and we tried to, except where we were there on the other side of the river or something, try to match them off that's as best the you can. That's so distorted a little bit, too, yeah, so that makes it even harder. But, that's right. But now that you mention that, I, I think you can match that far left-hand side there with looking down from the beach up. So we'll need to have a trip out to Chilkoot and yeah. a trip into town and all yeah. the various sites, Tanani. I mean, there's several that actually it could be. It just depends on how you're looking. And um, that's part of the study, and that's part of the importance of the yeah. study is to identify these. Okay, the last living resident out there was Patty Gannett, or Gunnett. Here he is in full ceremonial regalia, and this was found on in his genealogy at Ancestry.com by Nellie Pettit. Nellie did uh, genealogy of Patty Gunnett for us as part of the program. Um, he said that on the other side now of the river, the side where you have, on the um, east side where you, where the mountain fell in and so forth, there was a village over there. Yes, yes there was. And we have his testimony to that effect and now we have a photograph that actually shows it. And this photograph shows houses over on the other side of the, the river. And this is what it looks like today, that yes. same area. And see, you can see up in the left-hand corner there, um, Little Red Snapper or the, the mountain that broke it. So that helps you to identify where we are. Oops, go back up again. So you're going from the historic photo to the modern one. Now, archaeology, again, can be used to date that exactly but as, and complement his testimony. Now, this one is uh, interesting. This is starting to go back down the river now, and this area in here is right below the weir, and you can see all the different rocks. And the one in the foreground with the grass on it, that it so happens that the river is very high here. So you can't see as much as I wanted to show. But the one in the background you can see is layered horizontally. It has a lot of different layers on it. And its place name, where are we here? This one right here. Its place name is associated. Both specific rocks out here as well as the general area are called Raven's Dry Fish Bundle. Mm -hmm. And Austin Hammond had a little story that I'll read. He says, um, it was at Chilkoot that they taught me things about our Tlingit ways. My grandfather said, the time will come when these things we're going to tell you will need to be heard again. I tell you, for years and years, we found in the river our livelihood and our food, the strength of our families. And all along these shores were special places where the salmon would come, and each place had its own name. So there's many names that we've lost over the time. It was Raven who showed us how to get our food. Raven knew what was good for us and taught the Tlingit how to live. Raven exists in our legends and in our lives. 
Sometimes a raven is powerful and wise, and other times a raven seems foolish. But always the stories of raven hold special meaning for us. It was raven who hung by his beak, suspended from the clouds at the time of the great flood that you were talking about, Sally. Right. It was raven who taught our people to catch salmon. These are the stories my grandfather passed on to me. These are the things I'll teach my grandchildren. It is these stories that help guide our people as we live with the land. For Raven taught us, if we live with the land, not against it, the land will take care of us. The land, the river, they hear us. This is one of the, the um, traditional stories that goes with Raven's dry fish bundle, that particular place name. I had to get Raven into this whole thing somehow. <laughs> but that's very interesting. It's the whole region as well as certain rocks. Okay, now we're back down to our map. And if you look at the, we're looking at the, the red, our land, or orange, I guess, our land-oriented places. And then killer whale is the greens. Most of what we're looking at is going to be looking at is down. Let's see, where's your arrow here? Okay, here we go. Down around Lutak, we're going to be looking at all of them down around this side. There are two more up here. One is the Goat Trail, and one is a village site that was up there, um, which no one knows anything. Very few people know anything about that village site. They didn't even know it existed. There, there used to be a, um, a, a lookout up that way mm. for... Uh, in case of raiders, oh, okay. There was two of them up that way, and it goes clear up into Kelsa. Oh yes, there is a trail that goes that way. Yes. Tim Ackerman talked about yes. redoing, rewalking that trail, right. and right. reconstructing that whole route that they had. And that route is probably where the salmon went for the yes. trade to the interior yeah. as well. And so that's all up on the northern portion of this area. And some of those places, like she's talking about, will extend the site, you know, Chilkoot Kwan even larger once you start getting some of those stories recorded. This is um, at the mouth of Lutec Inlet, right where the river comes in, and it's called Mosquito's Little Bay or Bite. And I'm sure you know why it's called Mosquito's Little Bay or Bite, <laughs> because of the mosquito. Uh, also on, on that side, there's um, Killer Whale Little Lake, or it's also called Killer Whale Lagoon, and it's the salt chuck on the west side of Lutec Inlet. Now we're getting to um, a site that uh, you talked about, Sally. This is a, a site called uh, The Epidemic Came to Fight or Make War. It's also listed as a quarantine smallpox area, and it was on the east side of Lutec, Inlet and, um, well, the next picture will show you even better. But notice all the rocks up on the, on the hillside. There's a lot of caves up there, and many of the people who died were buried in the cave. But when they were alive, you can see the uh, creek or river coming down the side of the hill. That whole area at the bottom of the hill there is where, where these people were taken. And it was a quarantine area to keep them away from the rest of the villagers. And that, uh, there's been several smallpox epidemics here. And that one, uh, the most recent is like 1918, I think, around that area. They, they, they locked themselves in. Yes. They didn't let anybody, they didn't let anybody else in. Right. They just... And it, it looks like it's flat there in front of that. There is a flat area, but you have to go by boat. That's the only way you can get there. Um, this picture is a, a little bit deceiving. It looks like you can walk off to the yeah. left, but you can't. It's, uh, it's like fjord straight up and down in that region. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you can see those two bays or inlets that are circled. These are two more killer whale lagoons. So there were three place names for killer whale lagoons on this Lutag Inlet, which is really interesting. Um, presumably, they were chasing the fish, but hung out and, and bred in those areas. And that was important to know. Um, and now we're at the back part 
Um, and on the left, the point coming down on the left is called Magpie Place or Magpie Point. And so I'm sure there's a lot of magpies that, that hang out there on, on that particular point. So sometimes they're named after um, other animals and because the animals live in those areas, like the killer whale lagoons, or you can uh, find magpies at that particular point. Now this is, we're almost done everyone, this is a composite map that shows the location of the 50 place names. If you look at the legend there on the left, yellow are rocks, uh, blue are water, red is salmon, killer whale is green, and then land is sort of like an orange color. And you can see that they're all intermingled. Every color is just about everywhere. There's two major water sources, and all around those water sources and between those water sources, there's uh, a myriad of place names. I'm sure that these place names are one-tenth of what once existed, um, but we're lucky to have 50 of them. I mean, to be able to pull together that many is, is tremendous. And so that's what I'm using to establish the cultural landscape of Chilkukwan. And then my last slide shows the living landscape, because once you start thinking about those place names and what happened at each one that we were talking about, the different animals and all of the historic pictures you saw and so forth, it's no longer just a cultural landscape or a landscape with places where people lived. It's a living landscape. This picture is interesting because it, it was uh, both of the individuals were photographed in 1915 by um, Shotridge, Louis Shotridge from Klukwan, who and he worked at the University of Pennsylvania. And they're superimposed here on a 1920s snow shot of, of um, Chilkoot River going into the lake. And the quote that I have there is one of the one of my favorite. It's it really uh, you really have to think about it. It's from the Downhowers, Nora and Richard Downhower, one of their books, as you can see by the reference. And it says those a living landscape like this is uh, consists of those born ahead of us who are now behind us, and those unborn who await ahead of us. It's like uh, two heads looking in, in different directions. Those born ahead of us who are now behind us, they're behind us because they've died and they're buried, but we're saving this land and this land is there for those unborn that are ahead of us and are still waiting to be born. So with that, I'll finish my talk. Thank you very much. Good Any questions? Any questions? Of Sally or myself. So is there a lot of caves in this area? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's granite in the area and the way the boulders all fell, there's, they're more like rock shelters. Oh, so they're I shallow. have to define that, yes. They're shallow. <coughs> uh -huh. Because it's not, it's not a limestone area except the soft rock you saw on about the first slide, you can get that kind of thing. But to get really deep caves you need uh, a mountain that's where the geology is limestone and the water actually eats into it because it's so soft, like I said, and makes caves. Um, but this is uh, has a granitic background to it, just around the Chilkoot area there. Um, the last talk that was given last month, the, there was a talk on the geology and on the plants and so forth, and um, Pam Randall's talked about faults going up these systems, and there's a fault that goes right up, um, right up that area there, so that the Chilkoot side has granites, but the other side does not, uh, which is, is also very interesting. And these huge granite rocks that are heavy and dense, just like the one I passed around, will um, all have uh, fallen on top of each other in certain areas and created, you know, like shelters that you can get into. And that's where they buried a lot of the people, and particularly shaman. Shaman were not cremated like the other people. As close as we are to Allen, do we have a bunch of jade too? Or? There is some jade and artifacts that are found around here, but I've never tried to identify, you might know, I've never tried to identify whether it's local 
or coming from trade. Jade is such an exotic item anyway, for sure they would trade for it if, if they couldn't get it in, in various regions around here. Yeah. And so the land is it just as the glacier recedes and melts off, does it rebound or is it the plates pushing? It, no, it's it's rebound. Yeah, it's it's a rebound when the, the glaciers melted. I mean, well, it depends on what time you're talking about, I guess. But, the, you know, the historic time period from 1300 to like 1770, when that glacier melted, then you're getting rebound. It's called glacial isostatic rebound is the long name for it. But it's still happening today. Well, the glaciers are still melting, as you know. Anyone who lives in this region knows that. and so. Every year, you know, the land rises almost an inch. I was wondering, because we have all those faults and those plates are pushing. Mm -hmm. And more. they're still very active. That is true. Um, I don't know if Pam talked about. I wasn't. I couldn't be here last month, um, so I don't know if Pam talked about how how much they're still pushing each other. But I'm sure that they are because um, there's earthquakes in, in Alaska every hour. Um, going on. So there's there's a lot going on here. It's a very active region. Who owns the land along there now? That Indian land or is that park? Or park it's or? a combination. There's a, some state agencies. Parks has some. Forest Service has some. But um, there's also a native allotments. There's two or three native allotments mm -hmm. out there as well. Um, so who owns that little house across from the where? Um, Williams's. I was trying to think of Sonny's last name. Uh, the Williams family, Sonny Williams, but there's there's several branches of the Williams family. And um, what happened land? was that yeah. Parks, or Fish and Game built it, but they built it on an allotment. And oh. so they had no right to build it there. So the native people asked them to vacate it. And now they have a nice little cabin on their allotment <laughs> because it was sure. illegally you know, put on their land. So they don't use it anymore. That wasn't Phillips's, was it? Phillips so is out there Williams. as well. Yeah, they're both out there. Both Phillips and yeah. Williams are out there. So it could be. But it seems to me that, that that particular area was the Williams. I know they have several allotments actually up and down Lutac. I think Phillips is the start of the Perry On the other side then. Mm -hmm. I thought Phillips was where the culture came from. I don't really remember. Was there a, a Russian contact with the people of that area? Um, there was with Kluklan, but I'm trying to think. There's a ship that went down. Uh, well, I mean, they could have. The people, all of the first records talk about the people in that area, Chilkoot, Chilkat, all being the same people. I mean, they use one term for them, and they have several chiefs always met these boats. It wasn't just one person, but it was people from the different villages, the major clan, I guess, mm -hmm. clan leader in each of the villages. And so they really um, speak of them as, as one united group of people. And there was a Russian ship that went down uh, near Pyramid Island when it was deeper there. Yeah. And that was the other side of Pyramid Island going up the river mm -hmm. because they could go up all the way up to at least Yungastaki, four miles. They went up further. Clear up to 13 miles. Oh, did they? Yeah, yeah. And see, because the the land was lower, so the water was deeper. You know, in other words, the or the basin. You know, the river bottom was deeper. And as the land rises, it gets shallower and shallower and shallower. So that river was quite a bit deeper back then. And uh, so there was a Russian ship, and there's two cannon up at Klukwan, is there not? That belonged to that. And I think that uh, Mr. Schnabel, John Schnabel, has, well, rumor has that he has uh, one of them, I think, Tim Ackerman was telling me. So Tim Ackerman's a good one to talk to about shipwrecks. Yeah. He's studied those specifically, and mm -hmm. he's told me the story about the Russian ones. Finally, I re tape recorded him last time. I've asked him about three times, <laughs> you know, he, but he has a mind for these shipwrecks. Also, I wanted to mention the, uh, you know, you mentioned the different types of rock. Yes. The one rock you failed to mention was the uh, rocks, the, the heated rocks, mm -hmm. the, the, the white rocks with the 
black speckles in them. Mm -hmm. That they use that to keep their their lodges warm. Oh yes, you're right. <laughs> I guess I didn't find a place name for that, but I did know that. Yeah. I did know that because I remember Patrick Philpot when um, at 13 Mile when we found a sauna. Yeah. That was used by um, some of the local native people. Yes that he said, we were looking for the rocks associated, and I saw some rocks, and he said, no, those aren't the right ones. They would be these white ones the with white speckles rocks. like you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. They used that for, to keep the, the houses warm, mm -hmm. and they used the same rocks to, uh, for saunas, for, mm -hmm. to, to, for... Mm -hmm. uh, right, Gus Claney had yeah, one out yeah. there at his cabin at yes. 13 Mile. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting because I, I have not run across a place name. The white rock that I have run across is soft white rock, and mm. that wouldn't work for that. Yeah, no. It would have uh -uh. to be a harder. Um, yeah. It's probably a type of quartzite. It's, yeah. Because it would it's be harder the, like granite. From the, from the glacier. Mm -hmm. it, it moves down with oh. the glacier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hmm. You find it. Some it's, of the erratics yeah. left behind and so forth. Very interesting. Yeah. I will have to look for that. Thank you. you you'll you find it uh, mostly, yeah, in Chilkoot and around uh, out at uh, uh, Mud Bay. Oh. You'll find mm -hmm. it out at Mud Bay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we have um, a couple of different people, but Cindy um, Buxton is really good, a local geologist, yeah. and I'll have to ask her where the yeah. source, I'm always asking her these questions, she really studies deep, 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 old, 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 mm -hmm. so I'm asking her about these little surface deposits, and she's like, that's not my kind of geology, <laughs> you know, there's a several different kinds of geologists, yeah, they've I guess, traded but, back and forth yeah. for, you know, the all the dry fish and stuff, they traded back and forth for the rocks, rocks I'm sure and they did. Uh, different <clears throat> things that uh, they traded mm -hmm. back, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you saw canoes there. I mean, some of those canoes were huge. Oh, yeah. Some of the stories from the early explorers talk about like 50 people in a canoe. Yes. I mean, they have to be large canoes. And they were as large as some of their um, some of the ships, the old ships that they had. They had canoes as long as some of the old ships. And they had sails. On and them. they had sails. Yeah. But that means they could transport a lot in their trade. Yes. You know, like you're talking about. And certainly could hold rocks in it. Yes. Are there any questions from the other cities out there? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, yes, um, my name is Britta from Wrangell, and I had a couple questions for you. But uh, firstly, I'm curious to know if you found any place names that might have been um, indicative of vegetative changes uh, on, a, on like a global change scale. I know you talk about geological changes a lot, but um, and, and to kind of dovetail into that, what made you choose the typology that you did for classifying these place names with um, terrestrial and geological? and um, marine mammals. Mm -hmm. What I did, uh, uh, I'll do the classification first because I'm, I'm trying to think while you're talking if there's anything even related to plants, and I don't believe so, in the 50 place names that I found so far. Um, but uh, I sort of used a typology that Thornton had come up with. He looked at, uh, but he broke it down with all of the land and mm -hmm. then all the land elements and ocean and then all the ocean elements and then um, you know the animals he would have land and um, sea animals and to talk about for instance how many place names in the southeast are related to salmon and then which kind of salmon and something like that is is really interesting and this is what I was looking for is because the most, the salmon that's the most common is the pink salmon, but the, there's very few place names for pink salmon. The place names are for important resources, so to speak, like king salmon. There's a lot more place names for king salmon in the southeast. And so those kinds of relationships are the kinds of things he was looking at, because it's not necessarily quantity, it could be 
the type of fish that they consider to be important or the type of rocks or or whatever it is it's really their minds that you're trying to reconstruct and it will be different for every area he did generally the southeast and then he did glacier bay specifically and we are even different from glacier bay and um so what i did was just look at the 50 place names and see how they clustered how many of them were talking about rocks and how many were talking about fish and so forth and it so happened that i could go all the way up one side of the inlet you know through the river to the lake and back down the other side just the way that they happened to fall um but that's what i did i looked at my place names first and then broke them into the categories for ease of talking about them i guess and then at the very end what was interesting is they're all interspersed it's not like you have five in a row that's one kind or something uh, except for, of course, killer whales, but they're on both sides of the inlet. But it, it meant that every area was being used, and they just looked to see what was important in that particular area, the rocks or, or the uh, uh, subsistence resources. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, did, and you said that, that you hadn't found any places that were named after some type of vegetation or changes in vegetation that they had noticed over thousands of years? I don't believe so, no. Mm -mm, no. Now I'm trying to think on Chilcat River if there are any. And it's, it's mostly um, animals because they're, you know, really their diet was more related to um, uh, mammal animals, meat, meat, fish, meat, and meat fish. and fish, than it was the berries and so forth. It's very hard to even find place names for berries. They exist. There's some on, mm -hmm. on your side. But on the Chilkoot side now, I don't remember even seeing any, none of the ones, none of the 50 I have are related to berries or um, any of the other kinds of plants, you know, the plants that are used for other purposes, basketry plants, mm -hmm. any of that. Uh, there's no place names in Chilkoot related to it that have preserved now, that have preserved. There's another whole thing to keep in mind, however, and anthropologists and I'm sure the explorers and all these other people who recorded information about the Tlingit people tended to be male and one thing that we're finding is a lot of female related um, objects or activities weren't recorded because they weren't talking to the women they were talking to the men the interviews like uh, Thomas Thornton's major source is Herman Kika you know, and if you're only talking to the men, you're not going to get the berries. <laughs> you know, and so this is, I think, why we really uh, don't have a lot of uh, place names associated with plants. And uh, surely the women know. I mean, they know that soap berries don't lo no longer, you know, grow in this area or whatever. And um, they would record that. So I think... That might be one reason why we're not getting any. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other. I mean, surely they noted those things, though. You do today. You know areas that where you used to gather that you can't anymore um, because they just don't grow there. So very good question, though. I'll have to keep my eyes open. Great. Thank I you very through. much. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would think that um, some of the salmon names would be associated with season. Because I know that you can't, you couldn't get the winter salmon on the ch Chilkoot side, but you could get it on the on Chilkat the side. Yeah, Chilkat on, side. on the Kelsa side. Because uh, the my Kelsa dad side. would go up and get. They called it. Uh, it it was called red salmon, but not because they were what we call red salmon, uh -huh. but because they were spawned out. Spawned out. Yes. Yes. Austin Hammond has names, you know, places yeah. that he names after spawned so out red salmon. that would be salmon. something that I think that they would trade in the winter. Now that's that very interesting, looking at seasonality. The season would be different. That's a very interesting thing. Because, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it would be interesting to look at seasons and see if all of the place names are associated with seasons or times, or most of them where you wouldn't have some mm -hmm. of the plants. You know, because plants and animals don't necessarily coincide in seasons. They do to some extent, but, huh. I, and, I'll have to you, look at that. You brought up another thing, too, that I've just been talking to uh, my cousin about. And the fact that the trading was done, um, 
I think because the Anglos came up and they, they were used to trading with the men, but the men were the mouthpiece, uh -huh, absolutely. But, but they would go back. Mm -hmm. And Lance was just telling me that there's a, an account that he read about where the um, Clinket man came back and said, she said no. You know, I, I, that's I try right. to remember which one so that was. That's I right. read that a, a couple of those. That was a, a totally different yeah. concept brought to um, the Clinkets. Right. Was that, you know, because I think that the necessity from the woman's side, and this is just conjecture on my part, mm -hmm. is that um, the, the survival of the family was so much into in the woman's hands because the, the men were off trapping, mm -hmm. trading, That's correct. Yeah. and gone for lengths of time where the survival of the family and the house was in her hands totally. Well, and there's so, a... And, and I think that... That's very out of interesting. Out very, of necessity, very interesting. I think it was done that way. Vancouver, um, when he was up here in um, 1794, and actually he went up Chilkat as far as he could go and up Chilkoot and he was coming back down and they must have crossed the peninsula and they met him there and all, all of a sudden all these canoes went around him, war canoes. Well, every war canoe had one woman in them and she was at the helm in the back controlling where the ship was going. And I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And he made a point of saying there weren't any other women or children, just those that were and, and you know controlling where that canoe was going. And I think that's really symbolic. Mm -hmm. It is very it symbolic. Is very, symbolic. Um, very rarely do you even get mentioned unless it's the women and children stayed home. And in, in another in another book that I um, was looking at, the uh, Native American women, I think is the title of it, and it has an account in there of uh, trading in with the with the Klingons. And they said that the, they were describing that the conversation basically was that everything was going fine until the woman showed up. Mm -hmm. They were they were trading and then it stopped. Oh wow, so, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. See, the, these early accounts um, from the traders, the fur traders, and so forth, are just as important as the like anthropologist accounts because they're a slice of a moment. Like she was saying, everything's going fine, and then all of a sudden the women show up. And that's the kind of information you might not get otherwise, um, but he happened to see it. So some of these early, uh, you know, you should look at the early um, accounts from the explorers and the traders and the military when they came and so forth. Um, they're, they're very insightful that way. But women are left out quite a bit from the picture. Unless you're in a war canoe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, any other questions? Any questions for Sally while she's still here? Yes. Um, a lot of prominent, uh, prominent peaks are named uh, with, it seems like, a, a local language, um, indigenous language. In a, it just wasn't as well mapped on on uh, on your presentation tonight, other than uh, some small knobs and that sort of thing. I was wondering if that's going to be as uh, as important on your documentation. Um, like which names are you talking about? In in my area uh, or my area, the yeah. Chilkoot area. You're saying the Chilkoot area has uh, like one was mentioned the Shagnik Mountain, but I I don't remember all the mountain peaks, but you know, with a very few exceptions, they seem to have an indigenous name on most of the prominent, prominent, prominent peaks on the, on the maps I've been reading. The hmm. Shagnuk? That's not playing good, is it? <laughs> Had the uh, towers on top that you mentioned as petrified uh, people. Yeah. It was the one next to it. Yeah. yeah. No, but I don't even know if that's a Tlingit name, no. I don't believe. See, we have a lot of, we have a lot of place names here from a lot of different um, um, countries, um, people that came from different countries. And um, so they're not all Tlingit, you know. Um, it's Just like this Christmas mountain or Santa Claus mountain. 
I don't even know where that's at. <laughs> it looks like and Santa I've Claus lived is. all over all my life. And I'm, where is Santa Claus? <laughs> where yes. is this at? But, no, but, and a lot of the names changed. Yeah. They were playing up names, but now they're not. Yes. That was a lot of the reason I mentioned is I was wondering if, uh, if you might uh, bring some of your study into this area of prominent peaks because that seems to be what a lot of maps will have indicated on them. Uh, and what some of the original names were. Well, that's the, that's like an important mentioned. study, actually, because a lot of the trails were on the mountaintops, too. Yes. I mean, if they connected easily. Um, just trails in themselves going up canyons and mountains, they must have had names that we don't know about now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the kind of thing that Tim Ackerman is trying to reconstruct yeah. and find, find out by talking to people both in Canada and down here. Because some people remember things, others don't, of course. And, and they all have their own stories on the same things, too. The Canadians have all kinds of stories, especially glacier stories, because of the glacier fields there. But yes? Sally, in, uh, in the area by the bridge in Lutec, um, I recall that there were ooligan pits. Yes. Do you yes. remember the ooligan fishery from when you were young? Yes. And this was an important fishery. Yes. And that oil was traded to people in the interior? Yes. For southeast and in the interior. Mm -hmm. Yes. In our modern times, um, we look at the Uligan run um, and we say, oh, this is big one or this is small one. Do you remember how big they were when you were young? Uh, sometimes they would last three weeks, four weeks, uh -huh. and, and the smallest one would be three days. Uh -huh. And that you'd have to be dipping 24 hours a day wow. Wow. Before, it, before it rolls back down. Mm -hmm. And when it starts to roll back down, that is for your for your dried dried hooligans or mm -hmm. for your consumption. Mm -hmm. Less oil. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the, the oil is in in the uh, the eggs and oh, right. the sperm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, Sally, I'm curious, um, when we see the modern Uligan run, um, there are many uh, sea lions and yes. seals that come yes. into the river. Um, were those animals taken by the people of Chilkoot? No. It was not a food for them? No. Uh-huh. They, they, they're left alone. I see. That they're just, that's part of nature. You don't bother those animals. Mm -hmm. That's part of nature. Uh -huh. Yes. Plus they, they push them up. So it's you welcome even them because they are pushing the hooligan up. Uh -huh. They're, they're your uh -huh. helpers. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. And, and yes. they let you know they're there. You know. Yeah. You can and you them. don't scare them. You, you let them do their thing. Mute, mister. I got it. There, there is a less prominent winter hooligan run, too. Yes. There is. That, I, that, I that just... In the Chilkoot? My family, my family lived in the, um, mm -hmm. the Chilkoot area, but they went in the winter, they went to... Um, this side. No, they went to... Um, um, to Sankey Harbor? Uh, no, over in Skagway. The oh, river. Oh, dang. The river. Yeah. So there, oh, there was um, mm -hmm. a hooligan. Run. And you know that uh, over on this side, mm -hmm. the hooligans are purple in color. The males are purple. And the males on Chilkoot side are bluish in oh, color. Wow. Mm -hmm. And if, you're, if you look at them, they're beautiful. And I believe in in um, in um, 
Berners Bay, they're greenish in color. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if you're really sensitive to the, to what they are, they're a living being and it's given its life and the beauty of the, this, this beautiful fish and what it gives you, it is so much more than just a small fish. Mm -hmm. To the native, it's, it's, um, it's the king of all fish. To the white man, the king salmon is the king of all fish. But to the Klingits, it's the hooligan is mm. the Interesting. king of all fish. We did have one place name exactly where you were talking about, right where the, you know, the, the inlet goes into the river, right in that area there. There is one place name for hooligan. Yeah. 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 Uh, Sally, if I might, uh, just to uh, um, tell you that uh, a friend of mine found that uh, there were hooligan on the chill cap yeah. this last week. Yes. Um, this Winter. Course, Winter will again run. Yeah. And, and it seems yes. that it's been yep. mid-February every year that, yes, that I can does. remember. Yes, it does. Yes. And it was due to a um, um, chief's wife that was, that wanted hooligans. Uh, and he had runners uh, go to her land and bring the hooligan up up here for winter time and brought it all the way up to here so we'd have winter uh, hooligans. Now we always had uh, springtime hooligans, mm -hmm. hmm. but if Very you're sensitive of looking at the hooligans, uh, the next time you go down and dip them, uh, look at the color of the males. They're black on top with, and the, they have gold on top, uh, specks of gold on top of their heads. And the males in Chilkoot, uh, they're blue with little specks of gold on top of their heads. Well, how neat. Very interesting. And the salmon now, don't the, the salmon taste different to yes. chill cat and chill coot? Yes. And I've heard that often. And again, it's it's whatever they're feeding on, I'm sure, and, and the, you know, the, the clearness of the water and so forth. Yes. The, over in chill coot, uh, it's still salt water, mm -hmm. still off the salt water, uh, whereas up in chill cat, they have that 20 miles of right. uh, sweet water to come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they go further uh, up, you know. And I don't like it when they... <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you don't mind so many questions. But, no. um, but since you, you recall that area so well from your childhood... Um, I have been in Chilkoot and have seen a large um, group of, uh, of goats on the yes. mountainside and, and know that that fur was important to making the Chilkat blankets. Mm -hmm. And uh, was that something you recall from when yes. you were young? Yes, yes. It takes anywhere from uh, 10 to 12 hides. Wow. to make one chill cat blanket mm -hmm. and then uh, you you uh, uh, mix uh, yellow red cedar with red cedar bark mm -hmm. with that yeah mm -hmm. And there is that one place name I pointed out at the top of the lake uh, for a goat trail. Yeah. But Patty Gounette also talked about that in his testimonies in the 40s mm -hmm. about um, using that trail. And it was a very long trail, mm -hmm. evidently. And um, 
getting the, the um, and then also Austin Hammond talks about how the young guys would go up on that trail and herd the goats back down so they could shoot them down by the, the uh, shore so that the older guys in the boat, like Austin Hammond, <laughs> could pull them into the boat without having to climb way up on top of the mountain. And that was interesting, too. There is a, a story about that associated with that particular place name. Yeah. Any I'm, other questions? I miss Austin. I'm sure you do. I, really do. I wanted to mention one thing, when you were talking about Thomas Thornton, uh -huh. to let people know he will be here in Haynes. April 8th. Oh, my goodness. He's going to uh, be our speaker when we do our unveiling for the storyboard. And bring it up. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Well, good. Good to know. And is not your next one now the Dallenhowers that yeah, I Thursday. ended up with? Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Next Thursday. Um, and what is, what do they, do they have a specific topic they're talking about or just place names in general? Well, it's actually just a conversation. That really isn't the village of Chil Chilkoot. Well, then we'll go to the museum and correct that. And so you can still correct history <laughs> and and change these things because there are misidentifications no matter what. The thing that bugs me is that there's people out there that don't get the corrections, you know. But that's yes. what it is. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, like even the, in the Dowen Hour books where they talk about the Friendship Pole, which is at the museum, they say that James Watson from Juno carved it. And it was Jim Watson from Buckland that carved it. Oh. And two totally different people. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. very interesting. So, so that, you know, it just makes you always question or just, you know, never, you know, never think that everything you read in a history book is absolutely accurate. <laughs> that's right. And that's why I try to, for instance, to use four or five different sources. And the names yeah. changed a bit and it filled it out a little more sometimes and gave you more information um, on uh, some of those place names. So the more information, the more books you have that way, the more references, then you will find errors as well, and you'll be able to ferret those out yourself. So Sally, I'm curious, one, one of the things, as long as I've got you here, I hope you don't mind. I, no, I don't uh, mind. With, uh, with the pictures <laughs> that we saw this evening of all the fish drying on the racks, um, I was curious as to whether the people would eat the fish um, as they were fishing or was it um, or was there a custom where when you were catching fish you didn't eat fish oh you ate fish as you went along yeah, you ate fish uh -huh. now the only thing that you didn't eat is berries when you were picking berries uh -huh. hmm. you didn't eat berries while you were picking it okay because you'd wind up eating all the berries you pick. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That's a same problem today. Right. <laughs> Go home with an empty bucket. Right. <laughs> and so all, the, all those fish, they were for dry, uh, drying. Mm -hmm. Because they, they become really dry. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't need no refrigeration. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. uh, now maybe you don't dry like that and you put it in the freezer. Uh. But uh, back then, they were completely dry. And when I taught, and they that, put it, and they put it on a, um, a wooden box. Slucked. Mm -hmm. They put it in slucked, yeah. uh, bent wood boxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I taught in uh, 1979 in Lake Eliana area uh, above Bristol Bay, um, people dried fish mm -hmm. and racks all the time. It mm -hmm. was still practiced very much. Good. Yeah. And, uh, so very common to do that. As you can see, over in Chilkoot side, it it was a lot drier mm -hmm. than in Chilkat side. Mm -hmm. Now, Chilkat, we have to use our smokehouses. Mm -hmm. That's right. In fact, Stanley Hutch, when he saw all those racks of fish, he said, how could that happen? Because you have the little bugs yeah. in your area 
that would get all in them and, and spoil the fish and lay yeah. eggs and all that kind of stuff while they didn't have those out there. Yeah. There is a, there is, there's where your climate difference is shown right, right there right. In, in that particular um, you know, photograph with all of those fish. Mm -hmm. there was, we had quite the discussion on that because of those animals. Those I, can't, I, I don't keep it straight. Chilkoot and Chilkat, one of them means with a cache and the other one means without a cache? Supposedly, but I've seen it translated several different ways. Um, some of it just means plenty or, or storage. And they, to tell you the truth, in terms of storage pits, the cache pits that you can find archaeologically, you know, and you worked on some of those with me, they're in both areas. Yeah. The way Liv said that Jenny Quinnott described it, the translation to her, and, and I've had other people say that this isn't accurate, but this is what Jenny told Liv, was that both of them were like a container for fish, and Chilkoot was a container for big fish, and Chilkat was a container for many fish, because of the, the size the size of the run on the Chilkat versus the Chilkoot, and then the size of the fish were bigger on the Chilkoot. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there's a lot of different interpretations. I guess we'll yeah. never know. <laughs> well, the original name is Chilkot. Mm -hmm. How you say uh, how you say Chilkoot? Mm -hmm. Chilkot. Mm -hmm. And is there a specific translation for that, or Chilkot? It's just like a name. Yes, that's mm -hmm. the true name. Mm -hmm. And Chilkat is Chilkot. Mm -hmm. One, one of the things that you can value um, the hooligan um, for the clinkets is through the um, packing over the pass. Oh, they were yeah. paid in gold nuggets, but they immediately took that gold nugget and got hooligan oil because it was more of more worth, value. Yeah, it's worth more than the gold. Huh? So, yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And yeah. I was wondering about the storage. I mean, you guys were talking about storage. I've heard, I've heard of the seal oil being used to put put the fish in, but probably not the hooligan oil, I'm thinking. But I don't know. It Did was it was more expensive. The hooligan oil mm -hmm. was more so expensive. So you would use the storage for the... Um, yeah, for the, the, the seal oil. The seal oil, mm -hmm. yeah. Because it was more... more the berries, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, your fish and your meats and, and what eggs. have you, your fish, fish eggs, eggs mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you can store your fish that way, uh, meats that way, your fresh meats mm -hmm. uh, that way. Um, but for other things, your, your um, candle fish... You take a little bit of hooligan oil and your candle fish and... Hmm. I would think that was a, would be a delicacy, the, oh, the yeah. dried hooligans, because my kids ate it. Like oh, candy. yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got feathers and all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is there any place up here that the herring come in and spawn and lay eggs on the um, out it, uh, There's nobody's telling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mud Bay, yeah. Mud but uh, too many people just, and mm -hmm. that's it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, so they keep their... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I won't tell if somebody they tells them. They, <laughs> <laughs> they still dip. They still dip on just on the other side of Stony Point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do they? Mm. And and it's really evident when they come in. Yeah. Well, I've never. Been. I've been looking yeah. for fifteen years. Yeah. Uh -huh. They don't trust. I, I know who goes out there to do it. Well, just mm -hmm. ask ask one of the young men to go out, just like. Tim Ackerman. Mm -hmm. yeah. And young men to and Sally is, is what? How old? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 50, 50 years old. Oh, 50 years old. Yeah. So, I'm a young lady. Yes, you're just a baby, just honey. A baby. Yeah, wait until you get to be 72. <laughs> yes. Sally, mm -hmm. so, I have one more question. Oh, oh I'm I'm Yeah, one second. Um, 
from the presentation tonight, I was wondering, uh, the cemetery at the mouth of the Chilkoot River mm -hmm. didn't seem to be a prominent part of your mm -mm. representation. And I was no. curious if there's a reason that yes. I should know about or if I should just... No, there's a, there's an overall reason, which is really, really in, an, another really interesting thing. I mean, you hear me say, "Oh, very interesting," because all this stuff is interesting. One of the reason I mentioned is because I read in a paper one time a circular where there was a very large reward about a missing grave site out there. Oh. It's probably still something that could be researched and could be a very important part of a study. Well, the uh, Grave sites and real sacred areas, uh, like shamans' areas and so forth, did not have place names. Or they don't have place names that people use, or a place name that a pe person will say. And I asked, like Joe Hodge, why is it that none of these cemeteries and things have place names? Because we don't talk about them, you know, to other people or whatever. And if you do, you, you know, talk amongst yourself, you're talking about where your relatives are buried, you all know where you're talking about. So there aren't specific place names for cemetery areas. And in the same uh, type of thought, is it not a good idea to try to research, like, for that missing grave site and that sort of thing? Is it maybe best left just alone? Leave it alone. Yeah, yeah it's best You left don't alone. know what you're getting into when you're... If you want to die quick, I suggest go ahead and do it. <laughs> well, well, and also let me tell you, some of the cemeteries, if you look at the gravestones, there's certain areas up high where they'll have maybe a small group of people, like 10 people, all died within a year or two, and they probably died of smallpox or one of those diseases. And, you know, we still don't know how long some of those diseases the uh, molecules and so forth can still be in the soils. I mean, it's you have to be careful when you are dealing with historic burials and burials with diseases of one kind or another. And there's at least there's at least one at Yendostaki and one at Chilkoot that are like that, and there may be more. Yeah. And, and you can tell by the years, you know, that they all died at once, and so it's not a good thing. Is there some way you could counter, such as this circular that offered a large reward? For information, I was wondering if there's maybe there's some way that you could suppress in a, I think what they're trying to do is people talk to people, talk to people, especially in bars and so forth. They're trying to find out, you know, who was responsible and if they, or more likely if they have materials that came out of there that can go back, even if it's anonymous, leave it at the, you know, at the library or something or at the museum so that it can be returned. I think that that's more of what they had in mind with that. So, but the, yeah, they're sensitive subjects. And there's no place name, so I didn't need to talk about them. <laughs> so, Sally, my question was about, um, you know, there's a lot of different salmon that run up the Chilkoot these days, and I wondered if that was the case when you were a young girl. Did, you know, we have a, a big bunch of pink salmon run up at a certain time during the summer. And there's a sockeye, the red salmon that run up. And then, uh, you know, I've seen coho up in, in the lake, yeah. you know, late in the fall. Yes. And was that all? All the time. All, all the time, time when you were a young girl? Yes. All the time. And did the people use all those different salmon? Yes, or? they all, they yeah. used everything. They used everything. Uh -huh. So then, um, I, did, I didn't, wasn't quite certain, was a community at Chilkoot, was it a community that could live there all year long? All year yes. long. Yes, because you had so many fish coming through yes. so late in the year. Yes. There was plenty of resources. Yes, they had. Well, and there were times when I'm sure they did, because as she knows, there's uh, areas with, you know, up to a hundred storage pits for storing salmon That's a lot. for the winter, a lot. Yeah. And I think that those, that particular one I'm thinking of, I think dates to when the glacier was there. And that would make sense because now, like Stan Hodge was saying, oh, how can this be? Why do we have these? Because the ground doesn't freeze here. Well, it did. It just doesn't now. Yeah. And that helps you again to sort of establish, well, it had to have been colder and how far back can we take temperatures and so forth. And, you know, you'll at least with the glacier time period, you know that it was cold. 
cold enough for yeah. that kind of activity. So, so uh, Anastasia, my um, my sort of hobby has been looking at past sea levels and oh, mm -hmm. pollens and things for the past 15, 16,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not I, I'm not familiar with what the, the sea level was in that area at different periods of time. Um, and I've heard you mention tonight about you know glaciers coming in, and so mm -hmm. um, what time period would that have been? Well, the one that I'm talking about is the historic one that called the that some people call it the Little Ice Age from 1300 to 1750 uh -huh. uh, A.D. Yes, yeah. So um, because that's well documented, and there are traditional stories about those glaciers and people falling in those glaciers and. In Canada, they just found, long ago man found, they had a man who actually, because everything's melting, melted out of the glacier. And so where would that glacier have ended up? Where would its face have been at the end of the Little Ice Age? Well, that's a very good question. I had Cindy Buxton out there and asked her that very question. Because you do have a terminal moraine where the regular <laughs> glacier, you know, the old glacier, let's call it, yeah. went to the last real glacier, so to speak. Yeah. But she didn't think it would be that big, but uh, at least uh, in the lake. Uh -huh. Well, excuse me. I really enjoyed your program. Oh, good. So thank you very much. It was a more of, I thought you were going to go on about the Amway strawberries. No, I wasn't going to talk about Amway strawberries. <laughs> so, uh, Maybe Sally's strawberries, but not Amway strawberries. <laughs> and I know where Santa Claus Mountain is. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Well, and I'll tell you how it got its okay, name. This there used here. to be a children's home here. Oh, yes. Yes, and I know. And a friend of mine was raised there. Uh -huh. And she said that it's right across between the tank farm and Haynes. Uh -huh. And she kept telling me, see, there's Santa Claus and there's his pack. Yeah, it doesn't look like Santa Claus to me, but she, every which way I looked at it, I don't know. Yes, <laughs> but to those and we used that as home. part of this. They yeah. named yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh,